Hello. Nice to see so many of you. So, I just looked um, at the number of solutions I received so far somewhere. Can somebody raise your hand if you've solved any of them? Yeah, that's right. I've taught this course like seven times. I've never had this happen. Are you guys okay? Um, or is it like a huge midterm week or something that's impeding progress on the assignment? This is one of the harder assignments in the class in, in terms of time consuming as in this like two days until the deadline. And I've seen no solution so far. I'm a little bit worried. Do you guys need more time? Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I was also going to spend a little time on like getting you uh, off, the, off the ground. Um, do you have any specific questions about the homework that I can help address this from the get-go? Other than more time, because I'm just okay. No, you're like, oh, okay. Well, uh, I saw someone else posted on the other that this was happening to them, and it was happening to me, too. I was, when I GDB attacked me, yeah. and did the, the code that launched the shell, yeah. when I read it normally, it said a legal instruction, and uh, didn't launch the shell. So, yeah. So, two things about that. So one of them is that when you GDP a hack me one, it shuts off its privileges. Right? So it's not going to actually execute anything uh, beyond your current privileges, right? So you can't solve the exercise within GDP. It's for security reasons. Like, because the reason is simple. If I could just go to sudo, just GDP sudo, and then I break on like main, and then I tell sudo to do something completely different, like spawn a shell or root. I could just own the machine, right? It would be absurd. So that doesn't happen. So the reason why you guys have overflow one and attack me one, they're binaries that are completely identical. The only reason for why you have both of them is because you can do stuff with overflow one and get a core dump, which tells you the state of memory when it crashed. And you won't from attack me one because it has special privileges. So it's the only difference. So you work with overflow one, get it to work, get it to work with outside of TDB and everything, and then you just change the string overflow one to attack me one. There's in fact a reason for why there's exactly the same number of characters in overflow one and attack me one, because I don't want to shift your stack at all, right? Second thing is that GDB by itself inserts a few things into the environment table, so it shifts your stack around a few bytes. So you have to be able to account for that, so when you're running your exploit code outside of GDB, and just like in, in the shell, you may have to adjust the offsets back. So this is why it's so handy to work with core types. Now I'll tell you a trick that I think we, um, I think came up, but may have gotten forgotten, which was that if you've seen a crash and you're just wondering what's happening, let me just start a uh, session here. Let's go to Triton. Uh, Dmask. Do you guys remember this? Suppose it just got a site fault. Now I'll get a core file and I can fire a GDP binary and then core and like the right core. Um, and I can see where it crashed and what it was doing. And that's very handy. But sometimes you just want to know like, did that hit the instruction pointer or was it executing, uh, what was it doing? And it's so handy that the kernel has its own log called the kernel log or the log, um, which you can read using this command, emails. So what's happening here is that I'm taking the entire log and I'm just taking the last line, the tail of the log one line. That's 10 lines and one. So if it just crashed, this will tell me that the last person was executing stuff, uh, in this case it could be some other student, with this uh, process ID. <coughs> this is the instruction pointer when it crashed. And what memory was trying to access was this thing over here, which looks to me as if it's 08, 04, and then some two other instructions just misaligned by two bytes. Right? Very handy for debugging. So this will tell me how to fix that student's problem, like you can shift it by two bytes. Okay? So, extremely handy command that you just put right after you crash. Do this one um, When you open up GDP and you open up the binary and the core file, you're in a position where you can actually not just see where it crashed, but exactly what is on the stack, what is in the heap, what are these, all the uh, registers doing, and so forth. So, you can, in fact, see, okay, I'm here and I don't even know where my buffer is. I don't know where my shell is located. Well, go check out something thousand bytes before ESP, for instance. And you'll probably find your template. 
So it's actually very handy to work with a Chrome. Other questions? Do you have any questions? Yes, if you're running a lesson for one time, can you operate that one way? Yeah. So it, it's a little bit more complicated. The, so I'll start with the intent of what you guys are going to be doing um, in terms of shell codes. Is just use any shell code you find. We made one in class. You're free to use that one. I put one on Piazza. There's troves of them on the internet. You're actually free to use whatever resources you want to solve the remaining exercises in this class because there are no solutions posted for this exercise that I've created. And uh, for, for instance, Overflow 2, I think it was, that has alpha numeric shellcode, you won't solve it without using the internet to find how you generate alpha numeric shellcodes. Um, so in order to create shellcodes, um, what we were doing was that we, really, we realized that if you just write a C program and try to do certain things, that the binary itself relies on so much of its environment. It relies on having libraries that do system and do whatnot and so forth. And that means that it's an extremely unportable piece of code. Importable? Unportable? Not portable. Um, and so we decided to kind of just like jettison that idea and start from the very scratch of talking directly to the kernel, which is why we started writing an assembly that one time, right? And we created a shellcode together that I can share with you, and I've posted a similar one on Piazza, where we just talk directly to the kernel saying, hey, I have a request. My request is that I want to start to run execv, or execute. And here's what I want to execute. Here's the argument string. Here's my example. And this is by setting the registers eix, epx, ecx, epx. And uh, then I executed interrupt OX8, which is interrupt 128. All that means is that you're, you're running your program and you're like executing these instructions and then interdata happens. And it's like doing a call. You don't notice that something happened. All of a sudden your, your, your program is taken and it's like, it's completely like changed. It's, everything is thrown out. It's replaced with an entirely new body, which is fitness age. And now you're running a shell. You've been transformed. Normally what happens when you execute something in Unix is that you first call fork, so you have two identical copies of your shell, like, hey, that's mm -hmm. cool, and then you kill one of them, just, like take its body, change it to whatever it is that you want to execute, and all that is uh, another process running whatever it is that you want to execute. <coughs> Make sense? Um, so if you guys are stuck on your shellcode not working, find that the shellcode and just pop it in and don't worry about it. Um, if you are going the shellcode route, then you will have to overcome the obstacle of setting your UID before you run fitness hex. Right? And I posted on Piazza also some hints about that. There's several approaches here. One of the approaches is don't run bin sh, run bin zsh. That's the simplest thing to do because it doesn't set privileges. Second thing you do is write little code at the beginning of a shellcode that changes your UID to the UID that you want to be, which is your username underscore 01 or 02 or whatever you're changing to. So it's set UID or set rest UID. So it's a, it's a kernel call and then it's followed by uh, an exit via kernel call. Third thing you can do is to write your own C program that does your get, get to ID, or sorry, set to ID and set rest to ID and um, then spawns a shell, and then have your shell code spawn your program. So let's say your program is called blah, then you just have exit via blah, blah is a binary that comes out of your C file, and blah calls set to ID and then calls exactly finish it, and you're done, right? So we're trying to take this kind of simpler approaches to, to problems, right? There's yet another simpler way of doing all of this, which uh, I will let you guys unfold that we are. Um, but that's, that's kind of, the, that's the exercise. This is overflow one that I'm describing here in detail. Now, the thing is that overflow two, three, and four are all harder than overflow one, and so that's why I'm worried about the timing of this. Maybe I should pace this a little bit better in the future and have like, exercises do more frequently, but uh, it's good to know that uh, this is a, this is kind of like a deadline and they're like, oh my god, oh my god, <laughs> type of uh, uh, crowd. Um, other questions? <coughs> By the way, and, and I've had some questions about this, this is um, a set of exercises that is just looking at executable stacks and so forth. We're just writing our shellcode and running them. We're not doing any return to libc. Nothing return to programming. We're not doing any of this fancy new tricks. That's next time. <laughs> so next week you'll be facing that. Um, if I extend the deadline to Monday night, is that acceptable? 
I heard many not. In fact, more activity than I usually get in there. <laughs> yeah, okay. I'll, I'll take that as, an, as a solemn yes. Okay, good. Um, so, more questions about the homework? Yes. The objective of the homework. Yeah. Okay, so let's make that, that very clear. The objective of the homework is the following. Suppose, and here's just, let's say this is a backstory about why we're doing what we're doing. Suppose you have gained access to, uh, uh, suppose you've been given access to, to a site, like a, a, a server, like the lab service that are running here, or some Unix server somewhere. And on the server, there's lots of binaries that you have access to, including some that have extra privileges, like this SUID bit, what we're talking about. And if you were able to exploit these binaries, you would actually gain additional privileges on the machine. You could start to snoop around files. You could get people's SSH keys. And then you can really start hacking the world, right? <coughs> um, so this is something that was very common back in the day, maybe less common now. But this is a very kind of simple way of thinking about um, how you escalate your privileges in the control setting. So the binaries that we've created, this overflow one and tech me one and so forth, they are just examples of that. They're vulnerable binaries that have additional privileges. So the objective is that you are, I'm Emer, and I'm going to compromise another user whose name is Emer underscore O1. I'm going to hack the, the guy. That happens to be a clone of me, but I'm going to hack that guy. Normally, I don't have access to any of his stuff. So the objective is that I actually create a file in his home directory called success that I normally wouldn't have permission to do. And I'm going to do that by running a program owned by him and uh, exploiting, running off a shell and getting his privileges and then writing the file. That's the objective. And that's the objective for, uh, you're, you're, you're going to take over four people. It's uh, emer underscore 01, emer underscore 02, 03, 04. Right? Does that make sense in terms of what we're trying to accomplish? Or are you th thinking more about the kind of, what's the strategy for getting there? Yeah, so this is the why, in some sense, right? Uh, we can talk more about how. Do you have a question? Oh, uh, vaguely related, but um, when looking at the getTenant password, that, that area, mm -hmm. I noticed, in addition to the ones that are like your name, underscore a one, mm -hmm. it's also ones that are underscore F1. Is that oh, a later how prescient of you. Yeah, so what's that? That's the next lab. Next is not okay. Yeah, I'm just, uh, mm -hmm. I have my two days set up right. Um, so that's all set up for the next process of assignment. Uh, you don't have to worry about it just yet, unless you want to. Um, there were other questions that, that they sort of raised their hands earlier. No? Okay. So do you guys look good to go with the homework? Um, I have office hours as one if you guys want to just sit down in my office and, and hang on, get started or something like that. That would be useful uh, just to kind of get you off the ground. How many people would be interested in coming for office hours at one? Just so we can get a tally. So. Okay, yeah, you probably did it in my office. Okay. Cool. Good. Okay. So hopefully that's a little bit clearer. Um, maybe just since I'm on this node, alphanumeric shell codes. So one of the things that is in this assignment here is um, <coughs> that we are given restrictions on what we can put into the binary. And there's this really fun craft that was created, um, which is to use the very restricted set of x86 instructions that have all alphanumeric values. I mentioned this before for shellcodes, but it's just amazing that this works. So now you have to kind of think about this. Suppose you had only a handful of instructions. So let me just uh, find the list of... Um, Oh, here's a wiki page. That sounds very useful. Uh, how to write? Sure, okay. Let's look at one of these guys. Here's a. This is Frack Magazine. This is used to be the under. It actually still is the underground magazine of like where the hackers convene. So, for instance, the one we talked about, uh, this basic buffer overflows. That's something that I think was from issue. Was it 47? Something like that. It was, it was pretty, pretty late. Uh, for fun and profit. Where's fun and profit? 
Smashing the stack for fun and profit. 36 maybe? It's pretty late in the frack thing. No profit here, okay. Whatever. Uh, frack, smashing the stack for fun and profit. This is what really got people interested. 49, okay. This is what really got people interested in exploits, is that there were this... Um, there's this LF1 article over here which talked about like, hey, yo, you can you can write buffer overflows and all the stuff that we've been doing is right here. So it's actually useful to, to read. Um, anyway, so this is the Underground Magazine and it has here an article from probably not so long ago about uh, alphanumeric shellcode, so FRAC 57. Um, so here are the instructions you can do. If you think about this, this is a pretty limited set. So this is the characters like 0 through 9, A through Z, A. And like all the instructions that have only characters from this include things like you can push stuff, and you can decrease stuff, and you can increase stuff. You can't really do any pointers much. Few XR operations. Some crap. Like I don't even know what this stuff does. Bound and stuff. It's like something about segmentation. And then there's a few jumps over here. Jump if not equal, and it's all just eight byte registers. So we don't have any <coughs> move instructions. Don't have add or subtract. We just have a very limited set of XOR here for, for doing stuff. <coughs> but somehow, with all of this stuff, you don't even have int OS80, right? Somehow you're going to try to make a shell fit out of this. So I ask you, given this very limited subset, of things that you could possibly do, how on earth are you going to make a shell code that sponsors shell? And as a bonus question, how could you automatically solve this challenge? That's actually something that DARPA and others are very interested in. How do you automate hacking? We're working really hard on this problem that actually made scary progress. So it's clear, if you look at this, it's clear that we're not going to be able to write a very traditional shell class because we can't even have things like int OS80. So what would be a possible approach of getting to this? We have an hour with the five years. You have been summoned at gunpoint by someone who wants you to write an exploit that's purely alpha numeric. How do you survive this event of the stakeholder? What's the I'm looking for a trick here. What is the trick that we could possibly do to make any type of progress in this problem? If we could do, mm -hmm. then we could solve the challenge. Right? So have this shell code just then piggyback on stuff that's already in memory? That could be very useful, except all those addresses tend to not be alphanumeric. All the addresses within the program, right? We're really restricted, right? <laughs> but we need to somehow be able to do stuff that has non alpha numeric characters. So how do we do that? Let me simplify the challenge. Suppose you're writing an email client and you want to send messages to other email clients, but some email clients have no idea how to deal with stuff that's not alpha numeric. And you want to send this giant zip file. Of course, it has malware or something in it, but that's immaterial. You want to send a zip file to some of your friends there, <coughs> and they can only receive alphanumeric emails. You feel like translate it somehow? Yeah, how do you translate it? What do you do? We 
I mean, one idea would just be to say, let's just write the hex code, like four, one, four, one. That's all often numeric, right? It's a simple idea. We can do it even better by saying, like, let's look at, okay, we have eight bits for a character. We're only going to take, like, the six bits or something that we can represent within A through Z, upper and lower case. This is a two bytes thing. And then we're just going to break up this eight bits into, like, six bits and six bits and so forth, right? That's called UU encoding. So in other words, we can encode into a numeric shellcode with just effectively compress our code, right? So the whole idea behind alphanumeric shellcodes is that you create a routine that frantically tries to decode the rest of itself. So it is like a there's like a decoder at the very beginning that works on the rest of the buffer and subtracts all these bits and does all this stuff within the bounds of reasonable. What we can do is alphanumeric and deciphers the rest of the shellcode and then executes that. Either by jumping to it, using this limited jump operations, or just because that's the next instruction, I guess, that's right. That's cool, huh? Right? And in fact, this is what viruses do as well. And this is why virus detection is so hard. Because a virus is not just going to be like, oh, I'm this program, I'm going to destroy your computer, can I come in? Right? The virus is going to be like, I have this payload over here, and the payload is encrypted, the payload is all sorts of reduced. Sometimes the payload is polymorphic, meaning that every single instance of this virus is different because it has certain intent, but it can do each of the operations in different ways. For instance, suppose it wants to clean a register. Well, it could just move zero into the register. It could move zero into a different register and then that into the register you want. It could XOR the register. We can have different strategies for accomplishing the same goal, and then just randomly picks a bunch of these new bars. So you can have a fingerprint or a signature. Right? It's like, so this is in that same ballpark here. You have a decoding routine. So that's what alphanumeric shellcode creation is all about, is to see how do you write a decoder using only this? Because that's a much simpler problem. All you're doing is you're taking something, you're reading a byte from somewhere, and you're trying to expand it somewhere into two bytes. Right? Makes sense, right? still very tricky. And it's not something I expect you to do from ground up. But I expect you to be able to understand what you need to do to be able to run off an emerge shuffle. In particular, something that's going to be an obstacle here is that it necessarily relies on <coughs> knowing a lot about its environment. It, it relies on, for instance, having an address in ECX or in any register of where it is located, because it's going to be modifying itself. It can't do a call, because a call is known over there. It can't do like a push and the, like it, it has to do a call to be able to figure out its relative location anyway. So you need to provide that somehow. Unfortunately, in overflow two, you have space to do this types of things. So you have to be a little bit clever. Does that make sense? Like kind of high level? I don't know if you've looked at this problem in any detail, but hopefully this will make sense. Okay. I'm away. I was meant to bring my charger. Ta -da. Oh. Okay. It's just that. Uh... Oh, okay. So Jeff is just it's falling asleep. This is not good. Okay, picture mute, picture unmute. Ah ha, ha. complete. Good. Okay, so that's uh that was another thing. And then there's the chaining of different things and in overflow three. And then uh, overflow four, you're going to be looking at a very short shell code. So you're going to have to figure out how on earth you have shell code that short. <coughs> Probably not going to fit your entire shell code into what space is provided, so you're going to have to be clever. <coughs> so remember exploitdb.com? It's a whole list of, of shell codes that do very different things. It's worth reading about. Nice tricks there. Cool. Okay, so that's, uh, that's enough about the homework, right? Um, any questions before we commence our integer class? How do I find the address of, like, set UID or um, all those things? Just, like, make a program that calls it and then find that? So it varies by the program. So if you're attacking a particular binary, it usually is just helpful to just do an object dump on like let's say bin let's say user bin sudo 
subscribe, separating. Oh, uh, I guess I don't have permission to read it. Uh, let's pick out just of this. Up to time, and Steve, okay, sudo, grab security. Here it is. Security PLT. It's at an odd location because this is position independent execution code. Um, in general, GDB will help you also. So let's say we have overflow one, or overflow here, GDP attack me one, this as security. Um, overflow one, this as system. This as string copy. Da -da -da. So if it's actually called, it will know that. <coughs> if you want to know the libc address, which you won't need for this exercise right now, then you have to run it. So break main run this as a security. Now you can access the libc variant because you've already done it and I'm loading <coughs> other libraries. And then we're stuck with the poison node by the ASCII homework. So what was the plan to get this right here? I just uh, type this as. This is simple. Or p print set ready. I'll just type a GDP as your print. More questions like this? What is most confusing right now? Are you guys just like you don't know where how to start, or you don't know what how to make progress, or there's like just like always coming up new things that you're stuck on? I'm just curious, like how to best help you. Starting, okay. So, okay, so if you're from starting, just show up for my office after one. At any cost. Like, we'll get you started. Yeah? I know there was, like, for the other two assignments, it was a really long kind of how to start thing. Yeah, like the document? Yeah, the document. Yeah, it became a little bit more curious when I started writing the exercise of huh? <laughs> um, Yeah, maybe I should try to write something up on that. The idea is, though, that like the book has chapters on what we're doing. Um, so if you can find the book, read those chapters because it talks in excruciating detail about how you load up GDP and how you set breakpoints and all these different things that we need for, for those things. So the idea is that you can piggyback a little bit on that. Does that make sense? Um, yes? For overflow one, are there protections or something like that? No protections. We turn them all off. So why would a, a shell code that I can run normally, then I just throw it into that? Why would it not run? Like, why would it do that's what's happening to you. So I think there's something situation specific we have to look at. Uh, it might be, so here's something that does come up, and this will come up in the course at some point, is that if you're in your shellcode and your shellcode is using the stack, if the stack is at the same location as where you're executing, you may be pushing stuff over yourself, right? So if you're moving stuff onto the stack and that's where you're executing, you're going to get these weird errors. It's a really hard thing to track down. So just make sure that, so to, to fix it, what you do is that you subtract something from ESP, and that's where you push all your stuff. But to detect that this is happening, just put a breakpoint at the very beginning of your shuttle. So remember that trick that I think I mentioned to you at some point? Use the instruction OXCC, the N3. Do you, could, anybody remember? Sorry, N3. Anybody remember what this thing? Hmm? It breaks. It's actually how GDP does breakpoints. but. In your shellcode, when you're injecting stuff into your program, you have an offset in your shellcode, there are two things that you're trying to accomplish. One of them is to actually successfully jump to the knob sled. And the second thing is that you're trying to successfully execute the shellcode. And when you're debugging, it can get really confusing to know which one is happening. So what you can do instead is to replace your knob sled, instead of having OX90 for knob, you have OXCC, so that if you successfully jump onto any of them, What's going to happen is that your program is going to print out trap or like uh, I forget what the exact like it's not a legal instruction, but it just says that the program was trapped. You remember this from when I was debugging earlier? Um, it's a different error message. It just means that I was trying to execute your OXCC instruction and I stopped right away. It's like find a breakpoint and nobody's watching the breakpoint. So now you now you know that you're in your knob state. So the next time we need to chase it back to knobs and try again. Now, you know you should use your shellcode. You can also use this at the very beginning of your shellcode as an instruction so that you can uh, see 
You can step through your shell code as you go. So if you run up to the GP and you have OCC, you'll automatically get a breakpoint and test the shell code, and then you can just step by, step by, and see what's happening with registers and so forth. Does that make sense? Okay, more questions than that? You okay, Ray? Um, so, let's then get into some of the more modern stuff over here. So, you guys remember we were talking, and this is like, I know this is uh, uh, incredibly interesting and, and illuminating, right? And we're kind of like, how do you just work and see? Yes, yes, yes. It's so cool, right? Now, of course, the fact that this is kind of boring is what makes it something that most people don't know about, which makes it a right target for exploitation. The weird details of an idiosyncrasy of programs are a hacker's best friend. So if you want to be a good hacker, you shouldn't be afraid of being like, okay, oh, there's no documentation on this stuff. Let's go, right? You have to kind of figure out and fiddle and so forth. And you'll find weird stuff when you have that mindset. You look at your, like, oh, let me take some examples. Like people looked at their um, Apple battery, right? They took the battery on the left, their, their, their Apple laptop was like, how does this thing work? How does it talk to the machine? And they discovered that, like, oh, okay, when you plug in the battery, um, there's actually a protocol that talks to the kernel over there. And in fact, you could um, send weird messages from the battery of, like, I am 100,000% charged. So you could do all these things. And the kernel would just accept it because it's just like, <laughs> it's a battery. How bad could it be? So if you actually replace someone's battery with a rogue battery, you could own their Mac, right? That's just like the hacker way of thinking, right? Same thing for USB, like, I mean, USB control is like all, all this undocumented stuff that's going on. Yeah, go nuts. And people are going nuts right now. They're finding that, like, you walk into somewhere, you put in, like, a USB stick, and you completely own the locked computer. It's just how it works. Because you have almost direct communication with the kernel through your USB protocol. Now, none of this is particularly fun to read about as an engineer. And if you're a coder, you're, like, you dread your work, right? You like cry in the shower in the morning, you go and you write like your USB driver and you just hit yourself, right? And then as an assault, you end up with code that's terribly insecure. And that's that's what we do, right? You see? And of course, if you want to defend against it, you have to actually go out and read and understand how you can defend these types of things. Right? So here's an example of one of these things. And I know it's, it could be more fun, but let's go through this and then let's look at some examples of how this brings, right? So remember that we had this. Fun flowchart here. And I know everybody loves flowcharts. What is there not to love about flowcharts, right? It dispels party, right? It's like, yeah, flowchart, right? But it's really, there's not too much going on here. It's really just like short code of like three if sentences. And that's something we read all the time. Right? So remember, we had all these cases of how do we compare two integers? And if you were, for whatever mysterious reason, in a position where you want to write your own compiler, this is actually something you would have to think about, of course. If you're in that secure situation, you would enjoy thinking about this. But uh, it's uh, it's something that needs to happen uh, whenever a compiler looks at a C program or uh, several other programs. <laughs> things. It's how do you compare stuff? So let's take this example here. Here I have an unsigned char A, B, and C. And C here is the sum of A and B. And I do a, an if sentence here. like, hey, is C greater than 300? In which case, I'm going to print X. What will happen? And why? Seems that bit of two fifty five. Okay, so in terms of our flowchart, what has happened so far? So, nothing has happened in interesting with first to last. But here, there's a, an operator here, A plus B. So what happens with that? The same type, so they're inside of here. Yeah, same type, so they're going down, right? Yeah. So, that means that their solve is also the same type, so nothing else happens. So it's both, both the plus operator and then the assignment are separate promotions, effectively. And then nothing goes, no, it's C, yeah, yeah, this is all just unsigned char. Now I'm just going to like uh, silently trim off the extra bits 
of whatever goes in there. In this case here, we'll end up with a number that's, what number do we know? So this is kind of like minus one, so it's kind of like you can end up with effectively minus two, which is 254, right? Because uh, it's always modulo 256. You add up, right? It's always modulo one plus the size of the time, right? When it's unsigned. So here, if we do a comparison, now we're looking at our unsigned char, and here we're looking at a number, and we're comparing the two, and we say like, why? Okay, I have the number here, 254, is that greater than 300? Uh -uh. Of course, that's not the intent of this code. The code was supposed to be able to represent the summation of the two, and it totally failed. So here we would not print x. So a and b are promoted to integers. Plus operation is performed, resulting in truncated into the narrow type of an unsigned char, and uh, we don't print it. What about this one? And why? We print x. Is there any difference in the earlier thing? So it moves the most integers when it adds them. Uh -huh. It's never actually going back to an unsigned, unsigned part. It's just yeah, comparing that yeah. integer with 300, so it should print x. Should print x, exactly. They're promoted to integers, right? It's trying to represent the times. And so we'll try to promote things to integers if we can. Or if it's something bigger than an integer, it tries to promote it to whatever big type it is. So it promotes this to integers. The plus operator is performed, and you end up with the number, what was it, uh, 511, 500, 500 times. Um, and the result is then compared to 300, and yeah, it's greater, and so it prints x. So notice how there's no narrowing that happened there. Okay, let's take more examples. What about this one over here? Here's an int. And a long, and a long one. <coughs> and you can imagine that this keeps going, but like not, not, for, not for a while. So there's this implicit hierarchy. Actually, I think it's pretty explicit. Um, explicit hierarchy in C that says that a character is smaller than a short, which is smaller than uh, an int, which is smaller than a long, which is smaller than a long one. That's the hierarchy, right? And we always try to see, like, okay, when we say narrower type or same as something, this is referring to the hierarchy. But here, even though on 32 bit computers, int and long are both 32 bits, long is viewed as being better or longer, quieter. On 64 bit, it is. So what happens here? What is C what's, what's, what's going on in terms of promotions and so on? How many promotions happen here? Two. First one is yeah. So A plus B gets promoted to a long. Why a long? Yeah. So they are not the same type, but they are the same sizeness. So we call them the narrow type to wider type. In 32-bit, it didn't actually matter, but we were both viewed as long. So in 64-bit, it actually would have mattered. So they're both now longs over here. And then the second promotion that happens is, yeah, the whole thing becomes a long one, okay? Because same reason, yeah. So A is converted to the water type of B before plus is performed, which is the type of a long int is now converted to a long one. By the way, long and long int are identical. Now here's something that's kind of closer to our security mindset. Does this thing here print X? So it's going to depend, right, on what this is viewed at. And size off, it's this built-in operator, and it's supposed to tell us how many bytes there are in some particular uh, data type. 
Does it make any sense for that to be a signed integer? Like, oh yeah, you owe me four pies for this. Right? Negative numbers make no sense for pies. Right? Um, so it's actually an unsigned pie. So what happens then? Let's look at the flow chart. So now you're comparing these two numbers. There's an unsigned uh, int over here and a signed int. So we go through a chart, same time, uh uh. Same sentence, uh uh. So now we're in the is the unsigned time wider or same width as the signed time? They're the same width. So how do we arbitrarily break the time? Yeah, so it becomes. And therefore, is it going to print text? No, it's going to be like, hey, it's uh, 4.2 billion. Is that less than 4? Mm -mm. Oh, okay. I'll skip this thing. Right? This is what we're looking for as hackers, right? <laughs> cool, huh? Okay, what about here? So here we are. Uh, we're keeping going. Here's a long, long hint, and here's an unsigned. So we're taking this particular type here where Remember this special case where like, we were able to represent the range of the, uh, of the unsigned integer within a signed one. It's a very special case. So here, for instance, we're looking at A and B being binary, and we're, we're adding together. And it so happens that long, long int is big enough that it contains within itself the full range for an unsigned int. Right? So long, long int is 64 bits. And that actually includes all of the 0 to 232 values that uh, unsigned int can contain. So to preserve value, both of them are converted to a long, long int, a signed long, long int, right? So, um, <laughs> okay, with what? Did I say anything wrong? Thing? This, I think this is wrong. What's that? Oh, okay. This is okay. Sorry, I'm just gonna slide ahead. Okay. So it's long, long yet. Good. Okay. Now I'm hitting this one over here, and the answer comes up right away. Okay. So here's another one. This is the final case. It's another unsigned type. So here we have a unsigned int and a long int. We add them together, and yeah, we can't preserve the value because there's so many numbers in the long int here that could be negative. We can't fit them in, so we arbitrarily choose the unsigned. So there's going to be an unsigned long end. That's the result. Make sense? Cool, let's see some uh, more real examples now. So recall that we have all these libraries, right? And these are libraries that we use daily when we're using, when we're C programmers. I don't know how many people program in C regularly, but maybe we'll get there. Um, so you remember, here are good friends, string in, copy in, string in, tap and so forth. Printing stuff out in the buffer. Uh, malloc, some size, them copying things between places, certain length. And then reading from a file descriptor, either reading from a socket or reading from actual files and so forth. All of these functions here assume that their numeric, uh, numeric arguments, size t, is what do you want to guess? Signed runs. Unsigned, right? Because why would it be minus four? Like, like read back data to, to the user. Like, it took too many from me. Going back, right? So they're all unsigned. In fact, there is this thing called S size T, which is a signed size T. Um, I was doing a code review for, um, it was a credit card dispatching software, like that, where there was a bug in exactly this. They were like, they had a, a, a size T, and they were reading an uh, error value from something in you know, OpenSSL, and it could have been minus one. And then checked if it was minus one. And I was like, uh uh. No way you can have a minus one in, in size T, right? So it actually never checked the error, so you could write it or whatever, and you had this big one. Oh. So this that actually props up in modern software. Um, so let's have a look at 
um, what happens now is that you call these library blocks. You're going to implicitly convert whatever you have into an unsent int or whatever this size t is over here. So let's see an example. What, we, what happens here? And do we need music? I'm seeing a few faces that are like, please, no music. <laughs> okay, let's not have music then. That's fine. Stop staring. <laughs> Just imagine using that. So reading something from the file descriptor, it's the length of how much we're supposed to read, goes into our length variable there, which is an int. If it's more than 1024, well, obviously we don't want to overflow buffer, we're going to just stop. Otherwise, we just read into the, the buffer. It's the most innocent looking code you could find. So as an attacker, what do you think? Okay, this is the kind of problems I'll be putting on an exam. What is an unsigned int? Uh, the it's supposed to be unsigned. Oh, here, you did chip in unsigned int, is what you're saying? No, 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 in the, um, when you put it in, put in the length, with the length. Yes. Is that supposed to be unsigned? Yeah, so the thing is that because it's not, it will be automatically cast as, whatever you put in here is going to be cast as an unsigned int. Yes, right? so could you put in a number? Oh, yes. I mean, but, but if you have a negative number, what will happen here? So, in some sense, this thing here is being viewed as a signed number, and this is viewed as an unsigned. If this was actually an unsigned number, what would have happened? I don't like that sound. Uh oh. Uh oh. Yeah, serves me right. Cool, 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 cool. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I should bring a charger next time. Uh, can you run and get it? Okay, I think I have keys also. It's hooked into the docking station next to the piano. Okay. And it's this key. Thank you. Sorry. It's Dell charger. The Dell charger. Yeah, so what we're seeing here is um, like an example where we're comparing two things. They're of similar width, one is signed, the other one's also signed, so this converts the sign. So it's going to ask, hey, is minus one, is that greater than 1024? Mm -hmm. And then it will cast that negative number into an unsigned one without giving you any warning that this is happening, unless you really specifically ask for it. And you're going to read how much? Like 4 billion, like you have 4 gigabytes of, of exploit code. You're going to have the longest shell code ever. Like it overflows the entire program. Like, um, and yeah, so that's exactly what happens. So read expects size t and it's an unsigned. Uh, things will be viewed as a big positive value. Uh, as an argument here, and then you have a cycle. So here's a sign extension of vulnerability. So here's uh, asynprintf. Asynprintf is something where you write into a buffer a formatted string. So here it says, like, take the string argument that follows. So person that uses as a string, take the output of this conversion and put it into your destination buffer over here, and at most write length bytes. The length here is going to be um, unsigned. So if we get a length field from the user, suppose the length is just a signed character, then uh, what will happen if it's less than zero? What exactly happens if it's less than zero? But it's only a character so far, right? Ultimately, yeah, it's going to end up being an unsigned int, which is actually enormous. But it's because it had a character and then it had to sign extend it, right? Remember, it was like 
it's minus one. This is FF, FF, sorry, FF. And now it's going to become an integer. And this will be FF, 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 FF. And now that integer is going to be viewed as an unsigned integer, so it's four billion. This innocent little two by, uh, one byte thing over here turned into a, this behemoth as that. Make this as if it would be really, really cheaper. Make sense? So, as if it takes a 60, make the sign, we'll be widening the sign extension. 100 becomes 4 billion. Everything is terrible. Okay, so let's fix this thing. And this is something that's hopefully going to become a little theme for us here is that fixing is not easy. It's so common to see fixes that are completely inadequate. It's all the time. Like Heartleak, I think one of the first fixes for Heartleak was completely invulnerable. Bash, anybody remember Shell Shock? No? There was this thing that swept the internet that you could put in arguments that like uh, made Bash do whatever you wanted it to. Uh, it was a very bad vulnerability. But there were so many variants of it that they kept trying to patch it. It was a fundamental flaw in how they designed it that all the patches were ineffective much later in the process. Um, so let's try this. Let's just say, okay, well, I want to make sure that that blank theory is an unsend int. Okay, I fixed the problem. And according to Bedford's law of headlines, uh uh. That's right. Thank you. Much appreciated. Okay, let's get some juice here. Um, so, how would I say? Well, actually, what happens exactly? Is, it, is there any difference between this and the prior code? Same things happen, right? In fact, this is implicitly what happens. We just made it explicit. Still the same broken thing. How would you fix it? What? The what? Yeah, it's an of an of an Yeah, that solves it. That doesn't do it, right? So, something is wrong with the fact that we're moving from a signed character into an unsigned to begin with, right? So, the safest, if you were to modify anything here to Change yeah, change the type of length to unsigned character. Exactly, right? Because then there's no layer of a segment, but it's just going to get widened. Yeah. Um, so that's the same as those occurs. And um, let's look at this advanced example over here. Now we're reading something from a socket. Now tell me, how do you explain? There should be a declaration for n somewhere, but it's immaterial. Negative one. Okay, if then you wanted to link. Then it becomes a, so it's a short. What is a short? Term? Two bytes, yeah. So it's a 16 bit type and it's signed. And so minus one is perfectly fine there. Now there's going to be a comparison here between a, a signed short and a signed in. How does that comparison go? Yeah, short will get widened, so they're both short of integers, and then the comparison's there, and it's still just minus one, and yeah, no, oh, that's clearly not greater than the passage before, proceed. And then, what happens here? Yeah, this, this thing here, here's a, a short, and here's just a regular number, that's going to become a big sign integer first, right? And this is going to add up minus one and one. It's going to become zero. And then it's cast as an unsigned, because that's what Malik wants. And Malik's going to be like, oh, yeah, I'll give you this empty chunk over here. 
happily, we'll happily oblige. And then we're going to read into this very, very small buffer how many bytes. Yeah, it's short here, it's not going to get converted into an extended, so it's going to be like a first assignment, so it's going to be minus one, so F, 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 and then that's going to be viewed as an unsigned, so that's all four billion of them. So we're going to write four billion, four gigabytes into the zero byte buffer over here. That's a problem, right? Up to four gigs. And then we just write some zero somewhere like that. Very that cool. Yeah. So you have a short length, and then you read length, and then you read length, so I'm assuming when you passed it, it expands it. I forgot that part. Yeah, that's right. So the read length over here actually returns an unsigned short. So it read, read the length just properly as a two byte thing and returned it, but it then gets cast into a short, right? So what happens? So uh, if I put in something that's like, uh, if it's 65,534, that I get uh, that I read, get out of my read length, that's gonna overflow right? and become minus one in the uh, in the length. That's an important step. Okay, we're circling back and forth. We're always kind of what, what happens really is that we're moving the perspective from being kind of this is a signed number or an unsigned number. That's where we're moving. The bits really don't change a lot because they can get narrowed and changed and so forth. But really, it's just like is this number here signed at the moment or is it unsigned? And if we're juggling back and forth, you'll see some really unexpected results. Right now. Well, you have if this were, so what, what was your fix? No, no, just because it is doing an unsigned short and then it kind of gets passed into that. Um, when the extension happens, it's going to extend to what it originally was, and then it's fine. You're saying this is fine because we have an unsensor to begin with? I mean, it would overflow and like, it's a very bad thing, but wouldn't it just read the previous bits that were then unsigned short? Like it's, uh, okay. where it was like extending them? So what will happen is that your read length here is going to read the two bytes, it's just going to return these two bytes, it's going to be in the range between 0 and 65,000, and then you're going to take that number, you're going to look at that as being a short, so you're going to interpret half of that range, the one from 32,000 to 65,000, as being from minus 32,000 to zero, right? So a big number beyond 32,000 is going to become negative as a result of this assignment over here. Yeah, and then all the other stuff happens, right? So what would fix it? How would you fix this code? Because um, that's how we're working with it, mostly, right? If we're talking about length, you shouldn't have negative length. Right. Um, yeah, exactly. So that, that, would, that would do it. So here's what's happening. We think there's an FFF, there's a length, it's converted to short, so times one, take the square root of plus 24, and that is fine because clearly minus one is less than 24. And then there's a promotion that happens, side extended, ups are on, now I don't get the buffer size zero. So we read in like the four billion bytes here. So here's some actual vulnerabilities that happen. Symptoms. Here's one of the more famous truncation books. So this is from when we move from a white pad to an arrow pad. I remember this being one of the most exciting things. Uh, one of the most exciting things that happened during my teenage years. Um, so this was an attack where that effectively made you walk into any computer on the planet. Right? Everybody ran SSH. Nobody firewalled it. This is a remote exploit against it. You can do whatever you want. Um, and the bug works that follows. There was, um, people realized that there was this attack against SSH. So SSH is an encrypted version of Kellen, so it's like a connection with a remote server. Um, so what would happen is that even though every packet was encrypted, you could take a packet and you can replay it. So somebody who was like monitoring the traffic going back and forth between say you and the lab server with them could take one of your packets and then inject it several times. So if you type the letter like L, they could type L, 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 ha, 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 right? Or they could like select things out. Like for instance, they could be like, I know that person is entering their password. I'm gonna save those things. And then when they're like chatting on RC, I'm gonna inject the packets and they'll write their password, ha, 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 ha. You can think about like some like evil stuff like that, right? 
So this company called Core SDI decided to write a way, like a code to um, to mitigate this type of attack. So they added some, so the D attack, right? So they added something to make sure that there was like a, a timestamp that was with every single packet and just a, some some mechanism to prevent replay attacks. Right? It's a security company, correctly. And this is their code. And in their code was what like a glaring vulnerability, glaring vulnerability. Um, glaring in the sense that nobody found it for years, but like in hindsight, it was such a huge thing. And like the person who found it, found it but took this. I'm gonna log on with SSH on the cell, really long username, and the SSH server crashed. It's absurd. This is one of the most scrutinized software like, in history. Um, anyway, it worked as follows. So I'm going to just have you look at the code, and um, this L over here. Is the length of the packet that you got um, from the latest SSH uh, transaction. So you control L. Tell me what's going to go wrong. So this is L. L. Or is one greater than L? Yeah, it's up. It's just the font. It's terrible. Sorry. Can you do your allocation? Because N equals L, and N is just at a 16 in. Oh. And L is a 32 in. Yeah, so it trims things off from the link. Yeah. And then allocates a much smaller thing. So if L is like 65,536, N becomes 0, X smaller becomes 0. It's just the same thing as before, but a tiny term. But of course, there's a massive amount of work you have to do to actually turn it into a real exploit, including into like a binary search of like where you are in the address space and some other nonsense. But man, that was a powerful thing. Uh, it was featured in one of the Matrix movies, this exploit. So Matrix 2, if you like freeze frame it, you can see Trinity actually running this exploit. Um, anyway, so comparisons to the same thing. So when we're having, uh, when we're looking at arithmetic types and we're doing promotion because we're adding stuff for both playing something, same thing happens for comparisons, right? So let's look at a few examples how how comparisons can be tricky. So take a look at this example over here. Here's somebody who's trying to do the same thing as before, reading information from a socket, which is a very traditional thing to do in any type of uh, network protocols, and they're even bothering to check to see if the stuff is negative. What goes wrong? Yeah. Yeah. Something happens here. What happens here? The length would be converted to non-signed in. But if you had a negative length to begin with, doesn't that just make it really neat path to something? So we want to get both into the same type, remember? So if we look at our flow chart, so we have a signed short, and we have an unsigned int. We're comparing them, and then we're going to compare that against like what's effectively assigned in here. Let's see what happens. Let's just look at our flow chart here. This is so useful. Um, where are we in the flow chart?
Do we pass this one here? Unsigned time while or same with, right? So it's an unsigned int versus a signed short. Although it doesn't quite matter, it's the same end result. But what happens is that the signed operand gets converted into the unsigned one. Right? So we now go from our minus one or whatever in our short, so having four billion. And then we do a minus pass off. So this becomes like four billion esque minus four, still four billion esque, and that's now an unsigned int, and here's a signed one. What happens there? So the same width. So it's asking, is this gigantic number here in less than equal to zero? Oh no, really? Okay. In fact, what's going to happen here is this is actually going to get optimized out by the, by the compiler. They're like, if, well, actually no, it's not because it could be zero. But no. if it was asking is less than zero, it's going to be like, it's an unsigned thing. Like it's never going to be less than zero. Dumbass. <laughs> it's going to just remove it, right? And then there's another check here. It's length greater than max size. What's max, max size? So we're comparing short and the default is a signed integer. So they both become signed integer. So we're looking, oh, is minus one, is that greater than plus 24? Yeah. Right? So it just passes through that as well. Uh-oh. No. We reap our rewards. But hold on a second. What happens here? Is this familiar? What's yeah, so this thing here, just like over here, becomes it's a this is a short and this is an unsigned int. And so we promote both of them to be unsigned ints. So that we do the subtraction is like 4 billion minus 4, so it's still 4 billion is. Uh, some noise. So it's 4 billion, and uh, it's already an unsigned int, so we don't have to do any further casting for read. And uh, we read in a whole trove of Find information from our favorite client, right? soon to be a favorite client, into whatever process that is, thousand five bucks. So it's a massive stack over the whole. Cool. Okay, so here's just the explanation. Expression, length is promoted to segment, then we're an unsigned, and then the subtraction can never be less than zero, and so the check is ineffective, so that's what happens here. And then length of one, plus plus, and minus one also. Then we have these things, so we already went through this. So we end up in this situation over here, which is an unfortunate situation for the security standpoint. What about this one here? Uh, yeah, max is unsigned short there, length is, un is a signed short. Yeah, so the same thing. They're both going to be probably to integers, right? So they become what? Why are they both going to integers? Because that's what the, that's the type that uh, uh, they like, it's integer promotion. You know, they try to get up to at least n. So let's look at our flow chart again. So it's unshot short and the short. So what happens here? Same type now. Same 
Is it a wire or same with the design type? What are we comparing? Unsigned short and short, right? Mm -hmm. So end of putting the signed one and unsigned, right? So implicitly what happens is that it gets and it's an end to do the addition and then you can shrink down to the ultimate item. So we're going to end up with a situation where, where are we? Uh, here. Situation where the comparison here is going to be, oh, okay, everything is unsigned, therefore this is going to be a big number, and this is going to be a smaller number, pass the test. So this thing here is it's constant unsend, we get the second thing over. So it's always kind of the same thing happening again and again, right? We're slipping through some number, usually a negative number or a number that's too big, and then it gets cast and looked at as something completely different. The point that we're trying to make here is that making the tests work out for you is actually a little bit tricky. Because of all these things that are happening right now. And it gets even more confusing when we start to deal with compiler optimizations, like we talked about at the very first class, and then set and so forth. And hopefully, I've posted slides for a full lecture on that. Hopefully, we'll have time to go through that. Of things that the compiler does that is just absolutely frustrating. Um, yeah, so length and max short integers, the book that promotes assigned integers, <coughs> negative and length to leave it to length check. So you, you move from minus to like FFF to FFF. So now you're comparing minus one to max. So you pass that, you go into read, length. This is now, it's still a short, it's going to get converted into an unsent int, and so it becomes or a 4 billion. And I think this is the last one here. Um, just to fill in real quick. Anybody find the vulnerability right here? Hint. It relates to something I mentioned earlier. So we're not reading anything anymore, we're doing something slightly different. Hmm? Yeah, so it twice asks you to integer, so it looks at the uh, the debit event and it returns, I think a signed integer. Yeah, because you can read it in negative number. And that gets passed into this unsigned integer here, and and so what So if I read in what number? This seems to be a pretty stringent check here, right? To make sure that n is in the range of 0 to 1024, right? Or is there? So let's see what happens here. Um, so it's why. So if we put it, hmm. so this thing here should never happen, right? Because it's an unsigned number, which is zero. Both of them. And here is a comparison of unsigned and signed. What happens there? If I put a negative number, there's going to be a ginormous number of here. Now I'm going to look at an unsigned less than zero. And that's obviously going to be fine, because it's 4 billion, it's not less than zero. But then what happens here? Right. 
Wait, is it because of what becomes gigantic? How? Sorry? Because it returns negative. Yeah, it returns negative one. And it's an end captain over here. But what happens here? And this sign, these are unsigned over here. And therefore, this check here is completely immaterial. So that's a check that's faulty. So now what's going to happen is that he went there, it realized that something funky was going on, but it didn't quite catch it. So it's happened to a lamp set uh, of buffer of the character A. How many times? Four billion times, right? This is going to catch the unsigned. Crazy, man. Okay, thanks so much. Good luck with the uh, homework. So I guess I'll see you before the homework is due on Monday. So uh, office hours at one in my office.